And some of you have found this church to be your home in recent days. Some of you are guests today. You've come on a great day. We are honoring our graduates. A great day for them to be here. We're going to take a look back as we look forward into the future. You know, part of our story is that George W. Truett is the one who said there ought to be a church in the park cities. Now, some of you graduates, others are thinking, who was George W. Truett? Not to be confused with Truett Kathy, who said there ought to be a chicken sandwich. Um, (laughs) Praise God for both of these men. Um, But George W. Truett was the famed great pastor of uh, First Baptist Dallas. Uh, Back when, when this right here, this was the northern part of our city he said there ought to be a church and others believe that and agreed and they came around you know a lot of us don't you know it's hard to remember or think that our church was once a church plant it was a brand new church we met at up elementary any of you students anybody go to up elementary any of you guys yeah a couple of y'all university park elementary school for just a, a short period of time alton reed became our first pastor uh 1939 is when our our church started and it began then it started to to meet in a little now famous white house it's over on it was on lovers lane where now uh, scotland yard it's the highland park uh, high school ba- uh, baseball field and there the, in this white house uh, a group a band of believers came together who said there ought to be a church right here they added on to it so they could by the by the time they were moving away they could get about 400 people kids and everybody into that place, a house where we met. Uh, Recently, um, as I noted, so Dr. Reed became our first pastor, and recently his daughter came by my office, and she dropped off what kind of a memoir of him uh, that he wrote. Seven and a half years of his ministry, uh, he writes about all of his ministries, but he writes about being here in our church. It's fascinating read, especially for me as a pastor. Um, He calls out names and people, so it's very interesting. But... um, (laughs) He, and it's all good, but uh, he, he writes this. I wanted you to hear it in his own words. As they were thinking about what are we going to do, because they were purchasing land uh, alongside the, the White House. They started to purchase houses, thinking someday we're going to need a little bit more land than this one house. And, and so they were purchasing land, and they, he went and talked to the guy on the corner. So this is, I think, is far, like you're going towards uh, the tollway. And he went to that guy who owned a house there, which is probably Wright Field at Scotland Yard. And uh, the guy was a Methodist. And he said, and he said, the Methodist, he wasn't going to sell his lot to us, ever. <laughs> and so he was like, man, we've got to do something else. Uh, we're going to have to find land. In fact, we're growing so much here uh, that we're going to have to do something. So he started to drive around with other leaders in the church to find a plot of land. And listen to what he writes. Everything north of Southwestern, all right, if you know this area, right, several blocks south, from Preston Road to Airline Road to Northwest Highway was open land. Formerly owned by the Carruth uh, family, sold to, by the way, some of y'all know, Yarborough, a a deacon in the church. He, He said he went on to check with SMU and found they owned, they had purchased about four to five acres on Preston Road up to Northwest Highway. Shopping centers would be there, and he thought, plenty of parking. And even now, even now, you know, you get in trouble if you park over there now. He could have never imagined, Dr. Reed could have never imagined Sprinkles Cupcakes. I mean, come on, he could have never <laughs> dreamed that that would happen. Common grace to all people. So he told, the, he told the church, the leaders, oh, and he said this, while this was all boiling in my mind, I wasn't sure the church would want to move that far north. I mean, way on the edge of town. He said, they thought I'd lost my mind when I said we needed 10 acres. End up purchasing eight. And he wanted to say, he came back later for an anniversary to speak. And he wanted to say, I told you so. But he didn't. (laughs) I said it for him, I guess, right there. Um, So they had a sign out in front of the little house uh, that they put up. And it says Park City Baptist Church. You can see that. The sign maker um, messed up on the sign, but we didn't have money to fix it. And so we just went with it. Park, it's amazing. We didn't stay there, right? That, that's, but all of this because uh, someone said and, and people gathered, the Spirit of God said there ought to be a church right here. And a Baptist church in particular. There ought to be a church 
that preaches and teaches the Bible right here in the Park Cities. So Dr. Howard became our pastor in 1948. The East and West buildings, you may not know, these two buildings to my left and right were built first about 1950. Um, you can see a Berean class. This is a men's class that meets, that met. Right over here, by the way, was, uh, imagine, no hallway. That's, that's like the sanctuary. Okay, they're in the sanctuary in a big, uh, big class of men uh, that was just growing. Brother Bill's ministry, uh, you know, we've always been a part of, of mission work in the city from early on. That's literally Brother Bill with the kids jumping around. Many of you were there last, I saw you last week as we were serving over in West Dallas. So they, they continued on. Uh, VBS and young people in ministry. Um, why? Because there ought to be a church that reaches the next generation. Some of you were in this little youth group. There are some members in our church who were actually born in this church and, and grew up in this church. In fact, they started to raise some money for uh, the, the, uh, the sanctuary. So when Dr. Howard got here, they continued to cast a vision. And so you can see they're, they're raising money. That little guy in the middle, former, I mean, I mean, future deacon, future champion of missions, John Parker is who that is. Two years old. Yeah. So, yes. I saw Zona earlier, and I warned her. I said, I'm going to show a picture. I told John, too. And she said, that little chubby, little two-year-old boy, there he is. So, um, John, we, wherever you are, we praise God for you. Uh, we just got back. A bunch of us, uh, two teams, went to South Texas this weekend, or this week. And uh, so much behind John's leadership there. They call him the Pope. He's a bishop or something down there. But uh, there he is. And, and, and little did, did anyone know that he would be discipled and raised up. And, uh, you know, Dr. Howard, as they cast vision towards this plot of land and a, and a, and a, and a campus to come, um, you know, he, he is noted uh, as saying, you know, this is either going to be uh, the, you know, the, the biggest country church on the planet or it's going to be a thriving urban church someday. Little could he have realized uh, as they were breaking ground and finally moving into, um, into this facility, you can see the steeple being Placed and this, there's a shot from uh, Northwest Highway looking west, and um, and I've been told that uh, Fred Pendleton tells me his, his brother-in-law and others used to. If you can see this, so here's that's north, and students check this out. So you can see the church way back there. I know it's hard to see, but um, uh, there's a chicken place right there. Some people tell me about it was awesome before Chick Fil A came along. <laughs> Poor folks, but uh, anyway. Um, looking north, they, uh, Fred Pendleton tells me his brother-in-law, they'd go, they'd go out there and, sh- and, sh- and hunt bobcats out there that, that all up in the field. Who would have guessed? They could have never dreamed that the urban edge of, of the metroplex of Dallas would now be, you know, what, Prosper, Anna, 35, 40 miles away. In a lifetime, not very long ago. So 61 years ago. Our sanctuary was, was built, dedicated in uh, 1957. Some of you know my grandfather, a good friend of Dr. Howard's, before I was born, he stood right here in this spot and preached, spoke on that day when our sanctuary was, was, uh, was being dedicated. Just an amazing thing. Rodney Shell and I had the privilege of going to see Miss Howard this week. Uh, those of you who were in the sanctuary last week, we actually sang happy birthday to her, 99th birthday nearly a century young, and she is doing well, so well, that I wanted you all to see her. We have a little video. I want you to watch this. Listen. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that great? If they just knew how much I love them all. Oh, they do. I do, I do. Huh. I even went to see their new babies. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Did you hear? She said, if I only knew how much I love them all. She loves you so much. I was leaving her house, and, and I said, I love you, Miss Howard. And she says, what's become common in our family, maybe yours? She said, I love you more. <laughs> I said, no, I love you more. All the way out of the house. Um, she's doing really well. And just thank you so much, church family. So, and of course, the sanctuary. I mean, this, this was built in 1957. I mean, a dedicated, just amazing. I mean, D- Dr. Howard, nobody could have imagined 
that, and, and again, we, we can't do this any longer. We can't have, you know, I mean, we're packed and we need some kind of overflow here. But, uh, but we're going to, we, we have plans ahead, you know, to continue to grow and to continue to bring more people to Jesus. So you know that the gym was built ultimately uh, and, and, and the chapel on the other side. The gym was built and, which was really a pretty radical thing back in the day. And uh, in the activities area, they were playing pool in the activities area. Um, and why was this? To reach the next generation, right? To reach young people. We've always been about moving forward and doing whatever it takes. Why? Because there ought to be a church for the next generation to come. We're standing on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. And I want to pause here for a moment. I said that I've got an important announcement, really a great celebrative announcement today. Because early in the 80s, a group of forward-thinking people, a visionary group of leaders, started to think, you know, our footprint is, is settled. I mean, it's set. We're now landlocked. We've got, you know, buildings all around us and such. So a group of people said, well, hey, there's a house for sale on Villanova. Let's purchase it. Who knows what might come of it? We need some space. And then through the 80s and into the 90s and really through the 2000s, we ended up buying uh, one house at a time along the way. Now, our deacons know this. They've been involved in the process, our board of trustees and others. But on March the 19th, just over a month ago, church family, I'm here to tell you, after, gosh, that many years, since 1983, we have purchased the final lot on Villanova, and we own all of that property behind us here, just south on Villanova. Praise God. We praise the Lord for that. Yeah, that's incredible. Because of those who've gone before us, and, and you know, well, what are we going to do with that? We don't know. Little did they know what might happen here. What could God do in the days to come? We don't have plans for that land. There's been a lot of talk and all that kind of stuff. In fact, we're going to pull together a steering committee who's really going to look hard at a couple of spots here. We think that we can uh, accomplish all that we need to in our day right now uh, on our current campus. But uh, for the future, and I'll tell you more about some of that in the days to come. But long before Dr. Truitt uh, said there ought to be a church, Jesus said in Matthew 16, you saw it in the video earlier, we have a long history, and it goes way past 1939. Jesus said on this confession, Peter, that I am the Messiah, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does this prevailing church look like in our day? I want you to notice Jesus said it's his church, and he said he would build it. Christ is the head of our church. He always has been. Pastor is not the head of a church, not any group or people. Christ has always been the head of our church. In Ephesians 4, Paul talks about the raising up of leaders. And, and he, he uses this word built up. It's the word edify. It's, from a, it's an architectural term. It means to raise up a big edifice. Uh, and he says that we are here as a body being built up as a people. That Christ is at the center. And he's the one. He says this in, in verse uh, 16. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow up so that, here's the word, it builds itself up in love. Isn't that great? What are we doing here? Notice where we're heading. Love built this church, friends. Love built this the love of Christ for us and our love for him because someone was prompted by the Spirit. A group of people said there ought to be a church right here. Well, today I want to talk about our future and really the year to come because there still ought to be a church right here to the glory of God. Years ago, I read a book. Uh, it was called Jim and Casper Go to Church. Fascinating read. Jim was a Christian and Casper was a good friend of his. He befriended. They became dear friends. Casper was an atheist. Jim started to take Casper to church as his buddy. Uh, they went to several churches, and then he had this idea that he would actually take him to some of the most well-known churches in the nation, and then others that you wouldn't know at all. And so this is about 10 years ago. He went to some great churches that were reaching lots of people. And uh, and he came, it's pretty much summed up in a question that Jim, no, Casper asked, the atheist asked when he came out of church. And he asked Jim this. He said, so, so is this what Jesus told you guys to do? 
And the answer to that question, or how about that question itself, so be one that we're constantly asking all the time. Is this what Jesus intended for us to do? How can we always stay focused on what Christ has called us to do? Because let's admit it, gang, we often get off track. All of us do. In our own Christian you know, spiritual lives, we get off track. We, we, we end up uh, uh, focused on things that aren't, aren't, aren't core. And it, and it happens in a church, maybe more than any other organization. And in a church like ours, we've got to be really, uh, really clear and, and very diligent. Because if we're not careful, we can, yes, what we've done today, celebrate the past, but not lean into the past or, or have a bias toward the past. Because the Lord has called us to the present and into the future. And all of us are now here to pass the baton on to the next generation, to these graduates and others to come, to the little John Parkers who are out there, who are being raised up to serve the Lord. That's where our heartbeat is. That we're passing the baton. It's a function of not allowing cultural trends, you know, the hippest, coolest thing to guide us, or our traditions of the past that we want to cling to that may no longer be effective. And we go both ways. How do we stay the course? We get back to Scripture and the church that Jesus envisioned us to be. That's what we do. And so I want you to do this. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. It's our text for the day. You have a Bible in front of you if you didn't bring your Bible. Maybe you have um, a a mobile device, phone, or whatever, as long as you're not going to text or get on Instagram, all right, young people. But you can go to uh, Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to look at a a snapshot of the church. Uh, Everybody looking together. This is going to be the text for the day. Because what we need to do, I think the, the key to the future is to unlock the past. The key to the future to looking forward is to look back at the very best of what God has called us to. The core, again, it's message that never changes up against methods that are constantly changing. You say, how do you know what to change, what not to change? Well, it's not based on my preference, the church I grew up in, my daddy's church, or the coolest, hippest, greatest church we, we, we think we ought to be. Looks like this trend is going to work. Trends change all the time. And, and, and we continue to seek the Lord the way we know what to do is when we stay on course, which is to make disciples. Now, before we get to this text, I, I was on a, a bike ride. In fact, Stacey and I went on a little ride yesterday. Just incredible day. I was on a bike ride, and, uh, and I smelled it before I saw it. We were out at White Rock Lake, and then I saw it. My mind went back to when I was a little kid immediately. I started to taste it. Honeysuckles. Anybody? I remember when I was a kid, you know, you pull out the little center and just kind of lick it. And uh, I remember as a kid doing that, but my mind, in a moment, I smelled it. I'm like, yes! I had this, this kind of memory. And the church, listen, has a spiritual memory as well. We have a DNA within us. And if you're a believer and a member of God's big church, we have an imprinting upon us. We are imprinted with the Great Commission. When we think about the church, not just 1939, but when we think about those who've gone before us right after Christ and Paul, those in the New Testament, right here in the book of Acts, this is us. This is us. It's in our DNA and it's who we are. We are a Great Commission church. It's in our constitution. We always have been. Christ calling us to reach the nations. And so here's what it looks like. You know, you say, well, well what, what should we, do, we be doing? Let's go back to the original. This is the church Jesus envisioned. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So those who received his word, Peter's preaching at Pentecost, were baptized. And they were added that day, one day, about 3,000 souls. Now, the church had started a much smaller group, right? Really much a band of 12, 11 in the end. And they devoted themselves, that word is proskartereo in the Greek, it means passionately committed to, all right? Passionately devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. That's the big, big word, they're all together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all. Notice this overflowing generosity. As any had needs, they would share. And day by day, 
not just week to week, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Isn't that great? The Lord said he'd build his church. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Look at what they were committed to. We could say it this way in our day. They were passionately devoted to the teaching of God's Word. They were passionately devoted to deep Christ-like friendships and regular worship gatherings. They were intentional about it. They didn't miss. They wanted to be together. Intentional prayer gatherings. It says they, the prayers. There's this, this intentionality of prayers together. This overflowing generosity, again, sharing all that they, they had together with great gladness and gratitude in their hearts. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? They encircled new people. They were passionate about new people who were not yet a part of the family. They loved them in. I want us to explore what the church is and what it's not based on this passage. The church is, we can see here, real simple. It's a people we are. It's not a place to go. Now, we gather, and it's critical. We'll talk about that. But we often, even our language kind of betrays our understanding. I went to church today, right? Um, I enjoyed church. How was church? I didn't like church. Um, you know, how crazy is that? Church is a people. It's not an event on Sunday. In fact, the Bible says that we're his workmanship. We are his artwork expressing his love together, all of us, with good works that he's prepared for every one of us to do. Not just the corporate church doing what it does, but you doing what God's called you to do. The church is a way of life. It's not just the time of the week. This is why our, our gatherings are so important. And our connect groups, our Sunday schools are so critical. Because it's there that you take your first step into relationships with others. This week, many of you were meeting together for meals and coffee and in homes and parties together. We had groups on mission this week. It's the body of Christ together all week long. Paul admonishes us, whatever you do in word and deed, do it as unto the Lord. Our graduates will go off to school. You will be a student as unto the Lord. And you're going you're gonna to work hard and, and, and serve others, even on the college campus. So I've said it often. There's one thing, you know, it's one thing to go to church every week, and that's critical. It's quite another thing to follow Jesus every day. Are you following him every day? The call for us as a church to follow Jesus every single day. The church is a family to live in. It's not a club to belong to. It's a family. It, 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 when we come together, I wonder if you see others, even people that maybe as you get to know uh, others in the church, you realize, wait, that person not quite like me. They, they're not my age or they don't like what I like. Look what I like, like I look. Listen, we are family. Do you approach one another with a great joy and love? I hear this from guests all the time. You guys have an incredibly loving church. We were welcomed right in. So way to go, church family. I'm so proud of you and grateful. Because when we come together, it's a joy-filled response of gratitude. Who doesn't want to be a part of something like that? And it, it's all because of God's love for us. Here's what, for, here's what John says. I see what kind of love the Father has given us. That we should be called children of God. We're all children. We're brothers and sisters in the same family. And this family was built on love, on the love of Christ. The church is a body to serve with, not a place to be served in. Now, it's true, we serve one another, especially those of us who have great needs and those who are weakest among us. We think of little children and the needs that we have. For many of you, to be called out and to answer the call to serve our children we need people to serve in VBS coming up quick. You can be a part of that. You can disciple kids and raise them up in the Lord. You can hold babies, even during this hour, which many are doing. You can teach and guide our children during hours uh, prior to and, and, and this, this hour as well. It's a body to serve with. In, in, in fact, what's, what's a real challenge to the church in our day is, is that many people come to church as consumers. Of, of some spiritual goods and services. You know if you're here to serve others and to worship in, in, in gratitude and heartfelt response to Christ's love for us. 
You know that you do that when you come and you're not seeking, hey, what is, what's in it for me? Because too often people get off track. We're, we're prone to get off track and forget who we are. And you know if you're critiquing, if you critique uh, you know, music or programs or we find ourselves critical of the way things are going, watch yourself, check your heart. Uh, it, you, we miss the point. Instead of the joy of encouraging and serving one another. And we do this together as a body. We're a family, but we're also like one body. I love what Romans 12 says. We, though we're many, are one body in Christ. Individually members of, of one another. We're part of one another. So the guiding question as we move forward is, what's your ministry? Where are you serving? Because in the end, a church is a movement to advance, not an institution to join. Now, institutions and all those things, programs and ministries, all those are critical, but it's a movement, and it's a constant outward-seeking scent kind of a movement. People say, well, is it discipleship or evangelism? Yes. Is it young or is it old? Yes. Is it black, white, or brown? Yes. Is it traditional or contemporary? Yes. Is it, is it Spanish or ink? Yes. God is it, wait, is it the past or the future? Yes. God has called us as a people and as a sent people. We've always been a sent people. It's why John 17, 18, Jesus says, hey, as you, Father, sent me, I send, you, I send them into the world. He's sending us out from one generation to the next, each generation to serve in its moment in time. So devote yourself, church family, to worship weekly, to connect weekly, to serve regularly, and to multiply the lifestyle, to make disciples. Who are you pouring into? Who can you name? You're spending time. You're pouring into their lives. Like Paul did say, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus. Hang out with me as I seek to follow Jesus. This is what he's called every one of us to do. So I want to talk as we close our time. What's next for our church? I want to get pretty explicit here. Four focused areas as we move forward. And, I, and granted, this is a different kind of sermon today. I realize that. But I want everybody on the same page as we move forward. A very rare kind of moment. So the first area will be, of course, worship and connect. And here's what I mean. The whole Sunday morning experience. To celebrate the diversity that we have here on our campus. And not to say, well, they're over there or they're over there. But to celebrate that God's working in all, all things that are happening here in all of our connect groups. There's so many good things happening. You know, our new structure that we implemented last November has been has simplified Sunday morning. It's made it a lot easier to join into the church family and the flow of what we're doing. We've actually seen our worship numbers uh, up. Our attendance is up from a year ago uh, throughout the, the time over, over the year before and November 5th and beyond. But we've got some challenges, and we knew that we would. Last week in the Great Hall, for instance, we had 959 people. We have 900 seats in there. We've got a plan for the fall. As we move into the summer, we're get, we've got a plan for overflow, and it's a great plan ahead. You'll be hearing more about that because we want to make room for more people. There ought to be a church for people who are not yet here. The sanctuary continues to see incredible attendance. Our, our, our Hispanic ministry continues to reach out to its friends. We had baptisms just a week ago. But for the past four months, our deacons have been talking about uh, our current facilities. They're going to focus in the days to come on two, certain, uh, two areas in particular. There's been a steering committee that's been formed. Greg Boyd is going to lead the task as we pull together a steering committee that's going to help us think about our future. Because it's time for us to, 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 to think about how God is going to utilize all that he's given us for the future to come. And it's time. They're going to they're gonna be looking, as the team already has been a bit, our deacons, again, have been talking about this, our, our leadership within our deacons have been talking about this with our deacons for the past four months. One, one, one area, one place is right here, the sanctuary. We're talking about you know, it's time for us to upgrade, to refurbish our, our sanctuary. I don't know if anyone would live in a place for 61 years and really not do anything much. I can't imagine you do that in your home. This is the house of the Lord. We're talking about raising uh, the, the chancel where the choir is raised up a bit, a bit faster so that we have, uh, you can hear them over the orchestra. We're talking about extending the stage a bit where we can have the orchestra here with lots of room. Oftentimes when the orchestra, a growing orchestra, and choir, I'm preaching right here. 
you know, because it's kind of tight. So we're looking at possibilities and all that God would do among us and that we'd set up for the next generation, that that God would keep on bringing people here to worship. And you're going to hear in the days to come, there's going to be listening groups. They're going to come on a listening tour. We're going to be hearing from you, as we did in the fall, uh, towards our, our new structure, to listen to the church family, to get input. Always full disclosure, open communication. And we're going to be moving forward. Our deacons are guiding the way. Clear communication as we take steps along the way. And we'll pray together. And I believe that God's Spirit is going to lead us as we, as we move forward. Now we're going to continue to reach out to our Hispanic population. The fastest growing population in our city. And many of you know this. We've seen ministry over at Vickery. Many of you were there last week. At Tasby or Jack Lowe. Buckner International has started a a ministry, a a community life center over in Bachman Lake area. We are a part of that. Many of our folks already aware and a part. We need more people on the ground to serve as we seek to reach the next generation and those who are moving to Dallas. The next part, so worship and connect, the next focus is family ministry because there ought to be a church for children who are being raised right here in North Dallas. We have a comprehensive plan. You know this with Flight Plan 252. We are looking to, to raise up children all the way from being, being born all the way to graduates, being sent off into the world as we teach and guide. We're, 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 we're increasing our, our, our efforts on Wednesday night with our children's choir ministry, teaching kids how to sing to the Lord, Awana as we teach children, uh, God's Word, memorizing God's Word. From babies all the way. Why? Because there ought to be a church for families in our area. We have said that our church is a church for your whole life. It's a church that you can come to at any phase of life. That makes us a unique church, frankly, in many ways. It makes for a wonderful celebrative diversity. The third thing we're going to focus on is leadership development. As we raise up young leaders with, with a pathway of leadership and discovery of gifts As we've been praying over even new deacons, we're going to be raising up, training up leaders for the next generation to come. And the fourth and final, the the great challenge and focus ahead is missions and outreach. We're going to be continuing to send people off. I was at Men of Nehemiah this week. What a joy to speak to those men. I was with Pastor Abel from Cuba for lunch, I think on Wednesday or some day out there. Serve Dallas. Many of you are part of that. If we continue to serve at Cornerstone and Vickery, just an amazing thing. Just as we go back into our past, at Brother Bill's uh, ministry, I talked to Wes Keys, who's now the director there. He said for 75 years, you heard him, has been, uh, Park City has been the greatest supporter we've had as a church. We want to continue to plant churches because there ought to be a church in a place like Richardson, Texas. Many of you know that we planted the Heights Church many years ago with thousands of members now. We planted Valley Ranch Church with thousands of members now. Recently planted a church in Tribeca in lower Manhattan where Michael Rosina is the pastor. Hundreds of people. It's fascinating what's happening there. You're going to hear from Michael Rosina next week. He's going to be here with us to give us an update. We might pray over him because remember we were once a church plant. Churches, new churches reach the lost and they reach Uh, reach the lost quickly. There ought to be a church that's not yet here. And we can be a part of that. Legacy churches like ours must be planting other churches. So we have plans working with our Texas Baptist to start planting churches, more churches in days to come. We're very excited about the future because Dr. Truitt, along with others, said there ought to be a church. There still ought to be a church right here. As I was talking to Miss Howard this week, what a blessing it was. As I thought about her life, we don't know what the world's going to look like in 100 years. We know this. All new people. We know that much. <laughs> and we are here at, our, at this time to steward this moment that we have because, friends, listen, you know at night cometh. There comes a moment in time when we won't be here anymore. And I want, to, I want to call us to an urgent, uh, a sense of, of, of relentless urgency as we seek to serve God in our time. Because there are people all around us who need the gospel. They need Christ. I want to give you just maybe one more reason why there ought to be a church. It's this woman right here. 
A friend of mine was coming to a wedding not too long ago and took this picture in the shadow of our steeple. There are people who need help, who need the gospel, who need an answer to the questions they have. And you and I have been called at this time, in this moment, for such a time as this, to share the gospel with her, with our neighbor across the street, with our friends. So friends, together, let's commit ourselves. Let's recommit ourselves anew, even now. And I'm going to close our time in prayer. We're going to sing a song together that just declares our, our, our reliance upon the Lord. And then I'm going to pray us out with a benediction of prayer. Let's pray. I want to guide you in a prayer moment here. With all that you've heard, it's been a lot. But this is our vision forward that God has given to us, and, and not just to me. This has been a lot of leaders and lots of meetings and prayer along the way. God is moving. We are in a beautiful, wonderful place in harmony as a body, ready to take our next steps. We want to do so by faith because Christ is calling us, each of us. I want to ask you, have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you a member of a church? Have you joined this church? If you, if you haven't, friend, today's the day. Because you need the Lord. And you need the body of Christ. And I just want to ask each of us now, in this moment, how will you commit yourself anew to Him right now? What is He calling you to do? Tell Him. What is He prompting you to do? In this holy moment, Give your life to him. Lord, we praise you for what you have done, for the church you have established. Lord, we need you to rescue us from ourselves, to lead us to repentance, to be the church that you've called us to be. We need you, Lord. We need you. We give you our lives anew today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.